legalizefreedom.com. Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Gary Lachman, who joins us to discuss his book, The Return of Holy Russia, Apocalyptic History, Mystical Awakening, and the Struggle for the Soul of the World. Lachman's latest work explores how mystical and spiritual influences have shaped Russia's identity and politics, and what it means for our future. At the turn of the 20th century, Russia was undergoing a powerful spiritual and cultural rebirth. It was a time of magic and mysticism that saw a resurgence of interest in the occult and a creative intensity not seen in the West since the Renaissance. This was the time of the God-seekers, pilgrims of the soul and explorers of the spirit who sought the salvation of the world through art and ideas. These sages and their visions of Holy Russia are returning to prominence now through Russian President Vladimir Putin, who, inspired by their ideas, envisions a new Eurasian civilization with Russia as its leader. Hello and welcome, Gary, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, thank you for having me on again. Gary, today we're going to be talking about your new book that's entitled The Return of Holy Russia, Apocalyptic History, Mystical Awakening, and the Struggle for the Soul of the World. As usual, before we dive into that, just for listeners who don't know, just give them the potted bio, a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, um, I used to be a musician uh, many, many years ago, and... Um, I sort of uh, reinvented myself oh, sometime during the 90s into um, a writer about the Western hermetic or esoteric tradition and also about um, uh, what we can call the evolution of consciousness. And that's turned out to mean um, a few biographies of people like Rudolf Steiner or Colin Wilson or Uspensky or Jung and um, broader general uh, sort of histories um, as in the current book, Return of Holy Russia, or my first book, Turn If You Mind, which was about the 1960s. Now, the new book, um, if I recall correctly, we, kind of the idea for that formed while you were writing your previous book, Dark Star Rising, which concerns the uh, re- sort of reemergence of what you call occult politics and, and the election of Donald Trump. I got the idea uh, for doing this book, or for writing something about Russia in general, as you say, um, from doing my previous book, uh, Dark Star Rising. And um, that's about a kind of a cult politics that, as you say, seems to have materialized uh, around um, the run-up to Trump's election and, you know, during it. And this also um, had links to things going on uh, in Russia. So in that book, I did have um, a chapter uh, about uh, things happening there. And I had a lot of material left over from Dark Star Rising about Russia. And I thought, well, I'd like to do something with this. And I thought I was going to follow up on one of the ideas that's in Dark Star Rising, uh, this notion of Eurasia, uh, the Eurasia meme, as I, as I call it. And um, what this is is an idea of um, Russia being at the sort of forefront of a new civilization that's rising up in the 21st century, which is the Eurasian civilization. This is this vast landmass that stretches from Vladivostok, you know, into Europe and all of that. And it's, it's you know, it's the decline of the West. It's no longer the American century. And Russia is not just a new country. It's an, actually it's a new civilization. And so I was going to follow that up. But um, along the line, I <clears throat> became aware of um, Putin um, having this reading list that he gave to some of his regional governors at a meeting of United Russia, which is the major, uh, you know, uh, political party uh, in Russia. And on the reading list um, were, among, along with other people, uh, two uh, Russian philosophers whose work I was familiar with. Uh, one of them I was, I was very familiar with, and the other uh, uh, not as. But this is Nikolai Berdyaev, 
and uh, Vladimir Soloviev. And um, it struck me as like whatever you want to think about <laughs> Putin. Uh, I mean, it's interesting that he's you know suggesting this for his regional governors to read. And that, in general, um, is part of this kind of strategy, let's say, or gesture that Putin has been making to recapture um, a lot of ideas from this period just before the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, it's known as the Silver Age in, in, in Russian history, cultural history. And Berdayev and Solovyev and, and other many other people that I talk about in the book came from this period. And I was just fascinated to see that this is something that was being done because I've always thought there was a lot of very important ideas and a lot of important work, um, creative work and also philosophical work, uh, uh, done at that time. There might be some people listening who are not familiar with the term occult politics. That might mean slightly different things to different people, but if they've got lots of question marks hovering over their heads about that, how mm. would you, how would you characterize what, what do you <clears throat> mean when you say occult politics? Well, I mean, in this particular case, um, in, in the book Dark Star Rising, um, this got, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, sort of the prompt for doing that book was this idea that, um, people in the alt-right, um, Richard Spencer <clears throat> in particular and others had somehow used magical techniques of mental science or new thought or kind of mind magic uh, to help Trump get elected. And they supposedly did this through the internet. And this is the whole Peppy the Frog. Talk about memes. This is, you know, Peppy the Frog meme and all that. And uh, <clears throat> I don't want to go into that now. It's very, very complicated. But that was the, sort of the idea. And then when I looked into that in particular, it seemed that not only that, but other um, factors were involved where Steve Bannon, who was a a um <clears throat> on Trump's team at the time um he was a very um deep reader or whatever a, a, a committed reader of people like Julius Evola and Julius Evola is this um 20th century Italian esoteric philosopher who also had far right um, political leanings and he tried to ingratiate himself with Mussolini and also with national socialism and and he too um, used magical techniques to try and influence uh, Mussolini influence the politics at the time and Similarly, people in Russia around Putin were reading the same. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very broad kind of general thing. It depends how, you know, wide a, a, a scope, a wide an umbrella you want to open. I mean, Ronald Reagan, um, was an astrologer and he read Manly P. Hall and he was influenced by Hall's idea about sort of the manifest a destiny, the spiritual manifest destiny of the United States. So, I mean, that's just an example of it. Or an illuminated politics in the sense that the politics is motivated by a kind of visionary idea about uh, a kind of spiritual um, society, let's say, which uh, to some extent um, is, comes up um, in the Russia book, where there's at certain times in Russia's history, it actually was a, a theocracy where it was being run by the church and so on. So, I mean, it's... Um, Usually we think of politics, there's, you know, utilitarian, very practical economic ideas that, that drive it. Um, and then you have these, you know, the egomaniacs every now and then, or actually more and more of them these days, you know, um, uh, you know, demagogues and dictators and so on who have power complexes. And so they, they use politics for that. But this is the sense in which, you know, the motivating, um, ideas that, that, that guide um, sort of the political choices have to do with kind of spiritual or occult, meaning mystical, hidden, you know, um, visionary sort of ideas. Well, I mean, if you think back to, uh, as far as Russia is concerned, think back to the the Soviet era and for all that was like ostensibly atheistic, think about the, 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 the powerful use of symbols by the regime, you know, the same in, in Nazi Germany and any, you know, from Bernays on, onwards, anybody looking at propaganda and advertising understands, you know, the power of symbols, of logos, of language, of, you know, things repeated and things suggested, as it were. So it's really not much of a leap when you're considering that all of those things coming into play in political life, as it is, you know, in, in business and corporate life. To then, when you, the deeper you probe, you begin to understand the origins of that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it is that these are things that resonate, um, with human beings very deeply. You know, they're, they're archaic, you know, concepts. So it's not like it's anything, anything new as such. I just think it, I think it catches a lot of people by surprise mm -hmm. because you're talking about, you know, politicians and politics being ultimately pragmatic. I think any idea, of um you know anything esoteric or you know entering into politics is just seen as like you know again you know a relic from the past 
Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, um, no, there's a lot of things in what you said there. I mean, uh, I imagine a Jungian would say that, yes, of course, it's, it's all about these archetypal images, um, and these symbols that um, activate archetypes, which are these kind of deep, um, structured psychic blueprints um, in all of our collective minds and, you know, and so on. And uh, another step up from that is, well, magicians, or, you know, the poet, uh, artists, they know how to use those too to evoke um, certain um, states of mind and changes of feeling in, in people. And then you could say, well, uh, yes, I mean, a uh, magician uh, learns how to do that too on another kind of step up and all that. And, um, yeah, there's that aspect to it. But I think you can have that symbolic um work going on those symbolic influences without it being so sort of overtly or as it were covertly occult uh, in the sense that uh, you know you you do have some some extreme radical expressions of where people are actually practicing spells in some way let us say or in some way trying to use uh magical techniques you know mm-hmm. just as they would use propaganda you know they would actually use you know so they yes they're doing the propaganda but at the same time they're doing some kind of mental visualization um, that will help. And again, you talk about the Soviets. I mean, yeah, I mean, Lenin's, Lenin's, uh, uh, avowed aim was to eliminate interiority. You know, he wanted to get rid of the inner world, this whole idea that there was an inner world and you, you can't have, you know, any kind of magical or, um, spiritual or, uh, whatever reality unless you do have that. And, um, so, but he used symbols and, and, and all that, but he had a more, let's even say Pavlovian, um, idea of it, uh, but I was going to say that um, I mean, prior to the, when the Bolsheviks took over, one of the the main, if not the main, kind of aesthetic philosophy informing the Silver Age was symbolism, and this was the French symbolism that came out of Baudelaire and, and Rambo and all that, <clears throat> and um, it was all about the subliminal influences of the art that would somehow actually transform life, uh, and so someone going to a Metrolink play or or something like that would be. You know, um, it's not direct, it's not agitprop, but it um, it has a subliminal influence in which um, these things are suggested. You know, the notion that there's some something else, you know, there's some other meaning behind things, somehow shimmering behind things is this other kind of meaning. And, you know, the, the, the artist's job is to present that to you and, and the audience kind of gets the sense. And that, that whole notion was picked up. Um, by the early Bolsheviks, this notion that art should have a transformative power. But that's, in many ways, at the heart of the Russian kind of aesthetic itself. That, and I, I say in the book that it goes back to, Dostoevsky says it in The Idiot, that beauty will save the world. But this goes back to the very earliest days of, of Russia as, as um, a Christian nation, when uh, Queen Olga in Kiev goes down to um, Byz- uh, uh, Constantinople, um, and um, she's completely overwhelmed by the beauty of Constantinople and the beauty of the mass and the chanting and the, the incense and the icons and and all of this, um, the, the immense space inside Hagia Sophia and all that. And this is this notion of art having this transformative power, not 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 just a sort of satisfying one. You know, the, the Russians want art to be uh, to be their salvation. They want it to be salvific. Was you know we're happy if it entertains us. You know, it, you know. Well, this notion you mentioned a moment ago uh, with Lenin and the expunging of the sort of inner world, that's something that, I mean, that was kind of picked up by Orwell, I think. Um, You could say, you know, in 1984, this because for Mm. for many, you know, people who have survived terrible uh, conditions like prisoner of war camps or being captured by terrorists, whatever, sometimes for years on end, if they've made it out the other side, they've spoken about the importance of uh, like of inner strength, of having an inner world, and it's kind of your last line of defense in many ways, isn't it? Because they can do what they like to your body, but and of course they can try that with your mind. But at the end of the mm. day, at the end of the day, Gary, I don't know what you're thinking right now, and I say, you'd probably like it to keep it that way. And it's you know it's, it's kind of mutual. Do you know what I mean? So this idea of the inner world, I think, is very important where we are find ourselves right now in the world, actually. Not just if we're living in Russia, but just everything that's going on, because that's the thing that I think can make the difference between surviving and going under. Really, is what you what fac- uh, faculties, uh, what resources you have to call upon in your your inner self. Oh, uh, well, I think you nailed it um, there. Yes, is absolutely, it. and this is one of the uh, main sort of themes, um, sort of in the second half of the book, let's say, as we get towards the um, uh, contemporary times, 
um, where this whole um, in the 19th century in Russian culture, certainly um, the, this this theme of the inner world, or, or no, this utilitarian pragmatic one, which you can, you know, uh, this can be subsumed under a larger set of the me and the we. Which sounds kind of silly, but this is fundamentally a difference between the, the Russia and the West as well. Um, but I mean, but sticking to what we were talking about, yes, I mean, this is the thing: you can't have any kind of sense of freedom, you can't have any kind of sense of morality, you can't have any sense of value, you can't have any sense of meaning unless you do have an interiority, because the, it, it requires a subject to experience these things. Um, and the whole idea was, uh, no, this kind of uniformity would. I mean, it's. In terms of just sheer pragmatism and 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 having to you know actually um, try to achieve you know the greatest good you know so called for the for the greatest number which can only be a kind of you know practical utilitarian good it, it can't be an inner kind of good um, it does make sense that way but it only makes sense by you know excising everything that isn't of that of that character man does not live by bread alone and Lenin is saying actually no bread is enough. You know, that's kind of that's basically what that idea was. And but in one sense, it wasn't any different in the West. It it it, it, it wasn't being applied ruthlessly, uh, in in this kind of way, in an overt, um, you know, uh, 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 move to gain control of a country, and he did, and run it. But you could say, I mean, the, the Western, as I point out in the book, it, the, the both. But what Lenin was doing and what was happening in the West, say you could say, I don't know, the, the, the utilitarian, practical, economic, you know, capitalist West, they were both motivated by Locke's, John Locke's notion that there's nothing in the mind that um, didn't get there by way of the senses. You know, we're tabula rasa. And it all, it's, it's not nature, it's nurture. and it all depends upon the environment that you create. So Lenin basically thought, okay, if we create this environment that will produce, you know, um, well-meaning, you know, uh, motivated hard-working comrades who will all join together, then that's what we'll have. You know, so he wanted, he needed to eliminate any kind of native character that was there, um, or, you know, deny it. You know, it's the whole behaviorist kind of program. And similarly in the West, I mean, and this, I mean, you can say it's for good intentions, you know, they want to create a perfect world, but you have to sort of have um, robotic, mostly um, easily, easily uh, conditioned, um, you know, people in order to do that. Well, this idea of the West, the, the Western system, you know, the capitalistic system being inherently superior to, you know, any form of socialism or communism kind of reached its peak, I suppose. I mean, it's what, you know, you and I both grew up with really ostensibly, mm. didn't it? You know, that was, that was the paradigm. Things appeared to be with a few hiccups getting better for mm. people living in Western countries and other countries seeking to emulate the West. But when you got to the, sort of the collapse of the, Soviet Union and, and Francis Fukuyama's end of history thing, that kind of felt like, oh, okay, now this is the final nail in the coffin. Mm. But of course, uh, there were many of the philosophers and writers and other characters that are, make up the, the, the huge sweeping story that you tell in your book who had real issues. They may have visited the West and seen some things that they liked, but they did, many of them had issues with that. And it's one of the things I think that, uh, led to, Certainly, and when I started to pay attention to politics, led to a lot of conflict and misunderstanding. Was this this inability to get the Russian mindset or to understand that it could be in any way? Why don't they get this? Why don't they just mm -hmm. want the mm -hmm. same as we do? And you trace that right back in in history and how how that's developed and changed. And in that sense, in some ways, the the Soviet era was a bit of a I don't know, maybe too much to call that a blip, but it mm -hmm. it, was, it was certainly out of character in some ways, shall we say? Well, I think I think you're, you're right. I mean, again, it was a Western idea that was imported into Russia. I mean, as we all know, Marx, you know, Russia was the last place where the revolution should have taken place. It should have taken place in Germany, in a highly industrialized um, uh, country. Um, but, I mean, Russia, the situation there was, was so um, febrile and so, uh, it, you know, it just was a fuse waiting for a match. You know, it was just ready to explode for because a whole century of basically, what do we do with the serfs? And, and and this created this powerful moral conscience that that uh, this is this is what overwhelmed the West in the late nineteenth century when works like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and others came is that they were just so powerfully involved and and completely obsessed with these moral existential kind of questions that the West sort of just didn't it wasn't doing that 
um, you know, you had great artists like Flaubert and others, but they, you know, but they weren't they weren't people who were obsessed, you know, themselves haunted by these these kinds of uh, questions where Dostoevsky and Tolstoy was, and that they, they were the you know the the major you know the the peaks. I mean, um, others all around them were equally. I mean, it's the wonderful story Berdyaev tells, tells about you know these <clears throat> Russians all at a cafe. And the cafe owner wants to close because it's four o'clock in the morning. And one of them says, we can't go home yet because we haven't decided whether God exists or not. <laughs> so that was sort of like the idea. And so, um, so th- this was something, they, they took these ideas very, very seriously. And this is one reason why the, uh, the West didn't get it. Now, at the same time, there are many, you know, going back to at least Peter the Great, if not before, you know, there were, there were, uh, a strong influence in Russia itself to, to, that did want to westernize. That's the whole idea. That was the struggle in the, after Peter the Great. So between the westernizers and the Slavophiles who, you know, wanted some kind of indigenous, Slavic, um, non-western, non-practical, you know, almost a mystical kind of, but in, in a voc, vocus, vocish kind of sense, a, a approach to dealing with everything and, and the wisdom of the peasant and, 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 and all that kind of thing. And then you had, um, you know, Peter the Great and the Westernizers who, no, no, we have to, no, we're just, you know, we're just, we're, we're still in the Middle Ages here. You know, we have to adopt these Western ideas and, and quickly modernize ourselves and so on. And that's a tension that runs through. And, the idea is that the the general kind of take on things is that well yes but these ideas just don't take you know they, 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 these Western ideas just don't take for the Russian soul that's why in the 90s with the collapse of um, <clears throat> the Soviet Union and then you know, a couple years of uh, this notion that uh, Western ideas about the free market and um, you know liberal democracy were going to you know take root there then that all fell apart and it turned into you know chaos and yeah. And uh, out of which Putin, you know, emerged. Yeah, well, of course he has his critics. I mean, left, right, and centre, really. Especially if you're living in a Western country, um, he you know, seems that he can do no good, and that he's behind every, you know, that you slip on a, a banana skin, and you know, <laughs> Camden High Street, and it's like, you know, Russian agents put it there, sort of thing. You mean, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, but well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they did, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway. Having having lived through the collapse of the Soviet Union and kind of the 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 years after that, with you know the uh, rise of the oligarchs and and it's like you know Russia was like it wasn't quite lawless, but you know it was it had a sort of feudal dimension to it that was different to anything from the Soviet era. It's kind of like and many people have pointed this out, particularly Russians. Whatever you say about Putin, he took the situation in hand as it were for better or worse and brought some kind of stability and order in classic strongman fashion and it's hard to imagine what will come after Putin really I know that depends on many different things yet to be decided but nevertheless no I mean mean, well this is the classic story I mean um, again this is one of these uh, kind of traits that you find in Russian history where you do have this kind of, you know, disorder and then the strong man emerges even at the very beginning. I mean, this is the, the, the found, the foundation story is that, um, you know, the uh, indigenous Slavs, uh, were, you know, kind of warring among themselves all the time and, and these sort of petty, you know, battles among the, the, the you know, the, the small cities that were growing. And, um, they asked these Vikings, you know, these Danes, Rurik, uh, and they said, look, rather than you come and kind of raid us every now and then, why don't you just stay here? We'll take care of you. We'll put you up. And, and you can rule us. You know, we're, we're unruly and chaotic and always fighting each other. And we, we need someone to bring some kind of order and, and, and um, you know, authority uh, to our lands. And he said, okay. And this is the, kind of the founding story. And, uh, I mean, of course, there's critics of this, and, and I, I, talk, I talk about it in the book, where, yes, this makes a wonderful um, uh, kind of um, precedent that um, someone like Putin and any other um, strong man can point to, saying, well, look, this is our tradition. We need something like this, this kind of dem- democratic things don't work, which isn't true, because there's a whole, again, history of Novgorod, which was the kind of rival city to Moscow before the, the Romanovs and all that, and uh, which had a more democratic kind of uh, history and and kind of tradition. Um, so there's those elements are there, but they somehow don't seem to take, you know. Um, and and that's one of the questions in there. So and this is why, you know, you can see today, Putin saying, well, you know, we're not we're not a backward cousin of the West. 
and we're, we're this new kind of nation, but not nation, this new civilization that's coming in, you know, into existence now, because he, it's this kind of, you know, sort of like Spangler, where, you know, the West is going down, it's outgrown its, its, uh, its prime years and it's in decline, but this is a brand new, you know, time. And one of the interesting things is that this is the only time Russia hasn't been an empire. You know, throughout its whole history, it's been an empire in one way or the other. So um, they're, they're not kind of used to that, too. <laughs> in the limited dealings I've had <clears throat> with Russians and people who used to live in the what was it, the former Eastern Bloc in the 1980s, I used to write to a guy in Poland, and uh, I used to send him high-quality LPs, you know, Western bands that he couldn't get his hands on. He used to send me uh, very poor-quality LPs. Uh, mm. pressed in Russia and Poland, <laughs> but they were, they were yeah. novel anyway. And, and I find with him, and I've also found it with, with Finns and some Scandinavians, some Swedish, some Norwegians, a sort of seriousness. Mm. And mm. I mean that in a good way that seems to be quite rare in kind of, particularly in contemporary Western countries mm. in the mm. US, UK and, and, Many other places. So when I when I say seriousness, it's difficult really to to, to find another single word for it. But just put it this way: to, to the, the expression that anything goes and nothing matters mm, um, mm. is kind of the opposite to how some of these people I've how, how they approach a life and existence in general. Yeah, I mean that 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 what you just said there. This this contrast, you know, between anything goes and more serious uh, uh, approach to things um, is one of the themes that I talk about in the book, and this this is, I mean, whether how, tr how true it is or not, um, this is kind of what the new Cold War is about, um, insofar as we have one. So it's not about battle between capitalism or communism, it's uh, about um, the frivolous, indulgent, precisely, you know, anything goes uh, West, uh, which um, has what I call the me economy. Like everything, you know, you can get anything you want, whatever you want, you know, pretty much these days. You know, reality is negotiable, and you can pretty much, you know, and any kind of wild fantasy you want is yours, and you know, they're they're all available from, you know, uh, whatever. I, I needn't go into the details. And this is seen as just, you know, the the furthest extremity of this kind of um, commercialization of everything. And you were saying earlier about Francis Fukuyama and all that, and the end of history. And yes, it's because you know the free market is, you know spread around the globe and you know basically everything is this is uh, marketable and um, increasing you know the things are marketable and all that and this is something that this more tradition minded spiritual you could say uh, in, in this kind of serious sort of sense um, sensibility which is uh, what Putin is saying is you know that Russia is really about uh, they, they just find this um, just kind of just complete indulgence and all that and um, uh, in in Russia, it's not about everybody being out for themselves. It's it's you know it's tradition, traditional sort of um, you know gender roles, traditional sexual roles, traditional family models, and uh, you know there's a strong emphasis on the church and this hierarchical sort of thing. And so, I mean, how much you know we can equate that with the you know the land of ostentatious oligarchs and gangster politics? That's another question. But this this is the kind of gambit. You know, this is the way the struggle is presented or has been presented. And, you know, we, we can see, yes, you know, there's good arguments on both sides and also, you know, equally, um, you know, arguments against for both. But there does seem to be this kind of, um, I mean, I don't know how it is in Russia because I'm not there. I mean, I'm here in England, so I'm not in the States, which is, you know, the real target of this, I would say. But I guess the West in general. But, um, you know, it does seem to be, you know, increasingly... Everything is up. Well, as I said in Dark Star Rising, the reality is up for grabs, you know. If only as a kind of reaction to that kind of fluidness that everything's turned into, um, you have um, a kind of uh, a, a attempt to um, assert a kind of solidity, um, heaviness, and a weight, which is, again, something that the Russian soul... I mean, again, I, I was interviewed not too long ago by uh, this, this fellow I know, a, a Russian guy, and I, I, he's uh, a fellow named Nikita, and, uh, and we've done a couple things, and I like him, but he was sort of saying, oh, no, I was talking about your book with my girlfriend, and every time you said the Russian soul, she'd, oh, well, the Russian soul again. It's sort of like, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cliche, 
But it's also true, you know, that's the reason, you know, cliches become cliches because they're true. But there is this kind of, you know, more of a soulfulness, you know, uh, to it than, um, you know, uh, what, what you might find in sort of, you know, a more Western sensibility. Well, I mean, as, as, as being Irish, I'm supposed to be like hopelessly romantic. There you go. 100% of the time. And uh, all the cliches apply at all, at all and at all occasions. As you say, cliches are cliches for a reason. But, but uh, you mentioned tradition there. Uh, you know, saying small t tradition with mm. it for for a reason. Depending on how you bring up the subject of traditional rules and traditional values, you know, it could get you um, get you shot down very quickly in this in this current climate. Uh, but you mentioned Julius Evola, the Italian uh, guy, a little bit earlier on. He was around in the sort of first half of the. 20th century, wasn't he? I don't actually know how long he lived after the Second oh, he World died, War. He, he died, died in 1973. Oh, okay. So, uh, and then there's other, I mentioned him because there's this uh, this philosophy, I suppose would you call it, or maybe it's, it's a, a form of politics as well, of traditionalism with capital T. Oh, traditionalism, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No, and a lot of people think of him when they think of that, in his book, Revolt Against the Modern World, for example, yeah, which I'm still yeah. still working my way through. And then, but there's this other character, Alexander Dugan, that you mentioned in your previous book, mm, and he's mm. a, a sort of fringe, but very interesting figure in, in Russian politics um, in recent decades. Yeah, he con- he's considered a traditionalist, or considers himself one, but he's also, I mean, I'm talking about Dugan, but he's also, you know, very much, uh, you know, into chaos magic and Heideggerian, you know, philosophy and all this. I mean, he's kind of someone who, like, very appropriate for our age, you know, post, post, post everything. You know, he takes bits and pieces from lots of things and does this kind of bricolage or collage and comes up with these different systems and all that. And, uh, yeah, he is, has an interesting trajectory. I mean, I, um, he's the one who was promoting this Eurasia meme for quite some time. And, um, you know, it's debatable how much influence he had on Putin or who was direct or whether it just kind of trickled down, percolated down to him in some way. But um, I think you can say that some of the, you know, um, decisions Putin made about Ukraine and Crimea um, could very likely have been informed by some of the ideas that uh, Dugan had uh, and, and written about prior to it. Um, and, um, and yeah, he comes out of this tradition. I mean, traditionalism is uh, sort of founded by um, René Guénon, who's a French um, uh, sort of philosopher, sage, savant, who um, studied uh, Hinduism and um, then left France and moved to Cairo, and he um, converted to Islam. And it's a, it's it's a for me it's a kind of fundamentalist esotericism in the sense that there's this notion that there was this you know um, one truth that was you know transmitted to uh, mankind in, in the dim dim ancient past and. Um, it's at the source of, you know, it's the source of all, you know, the great religions and so on and so on. But they're they're all kind of tainted and and slightly corrupted, or, or you know, some more than other um, carriers of, you know, some of this tradition. And you have to, you know, peel back the layers to get to the esoteric, the exoteric layers, and peel back to get to the center, of the esoteric, and all that. And you know, there's a lot, it's, you know, there's a lot of interesting things about it. But there is this kind of very austere, um, authoritarian edge to it. And um, Evola comes out of that school, but he had a he had a, a very sort of martial military um, side to him. He liked to think of himself as a warrior and all that, but he, he didn't actually see action during World War One. Uh, uh, he was uh, he had said, sort of said that he wanted to and all that. But uh, in any case, um, so he uh, he had a much more militant kind of um, um, distaste for the modern world. I mean, Gainon had had no you know. Um, use of the modern world, but he was just, he was happy to wait on the sidelines for it to collapse, and he too, uh, you know, believed it was in decline and all that. Um, but um, Evelyn wanted to like knock it down. He wanted to help, and um, he what he wanted to do was through either Mussolini or through National Socialism to use um, their um, structure, you know, uh, as a form into which he could inject these um, esoteric ideas and these, you know, traditionalist ideas of hierarchy and order and sort of the caste system. And he's he was much more um, sophisticated and brilliant than say, the Nazis or Mussolini and all that. And uh, he had more sophisticated ideas of racial, you know, sort of differences. They weren't just the kind of crude. Um, ones that the Nazis had, but still, um, th- there was a certain sense of, um, you know, there's a sort of elect, um, elite kind of um, 
cream of the crop, and then there's um, uh, the rest, which, uh, varying degrees of usefulness uh, to the elite. And he, after World War II, um, he was injured during the last days of World War II, and he spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. He was this kind of eminent, uh, eminent Greece behind um, a variety of different sort of neo-fascist groups that uh, uh, rose up after the war. And as I said, he died in, in 1973. But people, you know, like the alt-right, they were reading him. Bannon was reading him. Dugan was reading him um, and, um, you know, imbibing of his um, sort of political, esoteric political ideas and putting them into this kind of, ideological mixer that he has and you know he throws in some some Evola, some Heidegger, there's some chaos magic and let me I'll a little come you know, two shakes of national socialism and a bit of, you know, um uh Stalin or something and let's see what happens. And so he he concocts a variety of different things like that. And um yeah, I mean, you know, he's um I mean he's still around. Um so um and again I I don't know how much or if at all any longer, whether his kind of time has is, 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 is passed. But um, yeah, his influence is certainly there. That concludes part one of our interview. Part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at legalizefreedom.com. Legalizefreedom.com.